Our presenter today is medical historian Susan Reverby. She's a professor emerita at Wellesley College. In the 1970s, Susan was one of the founders of the Women's Caucus of the American Public Health Association and was a staff member at Health PAC, which was a left-wing health policy think tank. Susan is best known for her work on the US Public Health Service experiments in Tuskegee, Alabama and in Guatemala. Today, she will talk about her latest book on her childhood and college friend, Alan Berkman, whose life went in unexpected ways. We'll have question and answer period after Susan's presentation. Okay. Well, thank you very much to um, the home team here at um, the American Public Health Association and the Socialist Caucus. I really appreciate um, this opportunity to talk about this, um, this book and about the life of my um, high school and childhood friend, Alan Berkman. So um, the talk and the, uh, is called The Revolutionary Journal Journey of Dr. Alan Berkman, Co-Conspirator for Justice. So hold on just a sec, let me get this back up. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Alicia Garza, uh, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, declared in 2016, being a political ally is often wrought with guilt, shame, and grief. Instead, she proposed co-conspiracy is about what we do in action, not just in language. As we know, from Anne Emanuel Byrne and Ted Brown's book, I think both of them are actually on the call, Comrades in Health. Many people in the various health fields became in fact such co-conspirators. The issue of course is what kind? There always have been of course, Americans who could imagine a world of racial equality and justice and who worked in cross racial alliances to make it happen not just at a street protest or by issuing heartfelt statements of support or compiling an appropriate reading list, but by taking definitive and sometimes violent action. This history provides us with a sense of how anti-racists are made, not born, and what it can mean to commit to being part of the struggle. It also illustrates the dangers of committing to violence or what was called in this time period in the 60s, 70s and 80s, armed propaganda and how actions that seem correct in one moment might seem less effective, even foolhardy years later. Dr. Alan Berkman made I, such bold- Sorry, I don't think we can see the slides. You can't, I said. So I basically quoting Alicia Garza about what it meant and now, and then the importance of Ted and, and, and Emanuel's book, Comrades in Health. So Alan Berkman made such bold choices about co-conspiracy and faced the consequences when he decided to support political comrades in the most radical sections of the new left. Raised in a small white working class town in upstate New York in the 1950s, this is Alan in our high school yearbook, um, who was voted most likely to secede. Uh, the woman on the left also became a physician, by the way. Um, and this, I thought some of you might find this entertaining. This is our high school honor society and there's Alan in the middle and there's me. <laughs> <laughs> Alan was not a radical um, in uh, college, unlike me actually at Cornell, where he played uh, football and was the fraternity president. This is his picture in the yearbook, uh, making eyes at this young woman. <laughs> I thought this was hilarious. Um, but he was moved to rethink his ideas after hearing Black Power advocate Stokely Carmichael his senior year. Berkman went to medical school at Columbia in the late 1960s and on his way to a brilliant medical career when the injustices and inequalities of America overwhelmed him. So here is, I just think this is fabulous. This is his fresh first year medical school picture, which looks all the world like, of course, a mugshot, which I thought was hilarious, but it was presumably <laughs> the way the medical school faculty could tell who everybody was. Um, I love that he's also got his middle finger um, pointing there, <laughs> just in case you're wondering what he was thinking. Um, turning down a future as a privileged medical research scientist after his internship year, he quit and took action by becoming a community doctor in some of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City. The violence he saw by treating the bodies of his patients, friends, and neighbors intensified his commitment to radical politics, especially 
after he went to the New York State prisons um, as part of a health delegation um, that saw the men after the uprising at the Attica State Prison in 1971, many of whom were nearly beaten to death. He saw firsthand how structural racism took its toll on communities of color, either through diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, or from the beatings and shootings by police. Raised by working class parents who believed in taking action, although at that point, mostly in Zionist and Jewish ways, Berkman was transformed from a concerned liberal willing to march in anti-war demonstrations to much riskier actions. He testified in police brutality cases. He snuck in under the lines, under the FBI's guns at the siege at Wounded Knee with his comrade and about to be wife, Dr. Barbara Zeller. And here's a picture of them at a news conference in 1974 with Clyde Bellancourt from the American Indian Movement. And they brought in, with others, they brought in medical supplies and provided care to American Indian Movement stalwarts at the siege. Most important was what he did conceal. He became one of the go-to doctors that served the political underground. The radical underground in the United States would not have survived as long as it did without such people. Berkman joined an increasingly like-minded group of comrades above ground who committed themselves to principled, violent resistance against the twin problems of American imperialism and racism. He was part of groups that helped to finance the anti-colonial struggles in Southern Africa because they understood the links between apartheid regimes and American racism. People saw, such people saw themselves as part of a long history of American anti-racism. By the late 1970s and early 80s, Berkman was in the leadership of the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee, an organization that sought to educate white people about the presence of the Klan and white supremacy in multiple American institutions, but especially among guards working in the prisons in New York. But he also used his skills and privilege as a doctor to advocate for lower level workers in the health clinics that employed him and was fired at least once for his actions. He continued to agitate, as in this picture of him at a demonstration um, to free political prisoners um, for the freeing of such people. Then he was put in a situation that both called on his medical skills and changed his life. By the early 1980s, Berkman became more and more willing to support what was called armed propaganda, actions that met state violence with other forms of violence, such as bombs and armed robberies to support revolutionaries. Like many of us today, Berkman watched the police attack peaceful protesters and black and brown bodies in the streets, in the prisons, and in hospitals. The attacks overwhelmed him and infuriated his egalitarian morality. Members of the political group that Allen was part of called the May 19th Communist Organization, named after the birth dates of both Ho Chi Minh and Malcolm X and full of white people supporting militant people of color, took increasingly dangerous action, like assisting in the release of Black Liberation Army member Asada Shakur from prison and eventually helping to spirit her away to Cuba. In 1981, unbeknownst to Berkman, Women in his organization's leadership agreed with others to drive the getaway cars in an armed robbery, what they called an, appro an expropriation, by self-styled revolutionaries in the Black Liberation Army, the BLA. On October 21st, uh, October 21st, 1981, the BLA initiated an expropriation of a Brinks armored truck in Nanuet, New York, just outside of New York City, to raise money for their cause. What had been successful on other occasions failed. Several shootouts occurred. Two local policemen and a Brinks guard were killed. Four members of the group were caught and another participant was gunned down the next day in a police chase. But there was another casualty. During the mayhem, one of the women getaway drivers, Marilyn Buck, pulled out her gun and shot herself in the leg by mistake, shattering bone and muscle. She was losing blood rapidly, but going to an emergency room was out of the question. By law, hospitals have to report all gunshot wounds. The police were already looking for her because she had skipped out on a furlough from a prison sentence for other political work. One of the conspirators called Berkman and drove him to the safe house where Buck was bleeding out. Although he was not involved in the Brinks action at beforehand, he felt he had to act. And by doing this and saving her life and then helping her escape, he became, as the government put it, a co-conspirator. 
The federal government was not willing to treat what would otherwise have been a misdemeanor, treating but not reporting a gun gunshot wound as a minor offense and prepared to charge Berkman as an accessory after the fact to murder because he refused to cooperate. But they couldn't prove that he had aided in Buck's escape, but they suspected it. He thus became only the second doctor in American history, we think, after Samuel Mudd, who treated John Wilkes Booth after the Lincoln assassination, to be charged for accessory to murder for treating a patient. With this hanging over his head, Alan uh, Berkman was imprisoned and serves eight months in a New York City jail for refusing to testify to the grand jury, convened to make the case against the Brinks suspects. Once released, he was about to be indicted again, unless, as the FBI promised him, he ratted out his comrades and could be put in witness protection. If convicted, however, he could have gone to prison for decades. So he made another choice, leaving behind his wife and small children, Berkman disappeared into the political underground in 1983. Although he never committed an act of violence himself, the bench warrant issued instructed law enforcement to assume that he was in fact armed and dangerous. Berkman and others in his group, now hiding from authorities under false names and fully committed to the movement, tried to make the price of imperialism and racism high. In fact, they managed to make it into the Reader's Joy Jazz Terror Network of the United States. There's Alan um, on the bottom here. Using various revolutionary names, they organized bombings preceded by a telephone call that permitted people to evacuate of American political sites that included an FBI office and a US center, Senate F antechamber. Um, no one was ever harmed in their bombings. After nearly two years, Berkman and his comrades were caught one by one and tried in differing cases. Berkman was given 10 years for his link to explosives found in Pennsylvania. Others in his group, including Laura Whitehorn, Susan Rosenberg, Marilyn Buck, Linda Evans, and Timothy Blunk, received sentences that were two to five times that long because they were directly linked to the theft of explosives used in the bombings. Their last joint statement, which Berkman and his comrades labeled the resistance conspiracy case, charged that they had tried to, and I quote from their indictment, to influence, change, and protest policies and practices of the United States government concerning various international and domestic matters to the use of violent and illegal means. And as one of his comrades put it, the answer to that was, yes, we did, but of course, how do we say that we're, quote, innocent? During the years he served his time in some of our harshest federal prisons, often in solitary, Berkman was diagnosed with and nearly died from cancer and the inadequate prison health care available to him. Here is Alan speaking briefly, and I hope you can hear this, I hope this works, um, about what it was like to have cancer in prison. Alan at the Manhattan Correction Center talks about having cancer in prison. Trying to go out to a hospital to get tests, trying to be seen by a decent doctor, trying to get adequate treatment at every step of the way, what happens is that, quote, the security issues become the cover story for the fact that they either would try to break us or let us die. So after a failed parole campaign that involved actually a wonderful story um, called Death by Delay by the famous New York Times writer, Anthony Lewis, um, uh, Allen's comrades agreed to settle their resistance conspiracy case to keep him from dying from the stress of a possible trial. When he wasn't too sick, Berkman continued the work that had brought him to the movement in the first place, providing jailhouse medical care to his primarily black and Latino prison mates, he earned their respect and a nickname, Brother Doc. So I thought this was beautiful. This is Alan, um, who was painted onto a mural that now uh, lives in the student union at San Francisco State University. So on the left here is Leonard Pelletier of the American Indian Movement, Dilcia Pagan from the Puerto Rican group, the FALN. This is Alan, and this is Geronimo Pratt from the uh, uh, Black Panthers. Uh, Berkman used his time in prison to rethink what he had done and to discuss as this shot from him looking quite sick um, in a 60 minute CBS program about the failures of prison medical care. He began to see the limitations of both small group political work and violent resistance. He knew he had acted on principles, had never harmed anyone, although he clearly could have. 
As he approached his release date, his lawyer persuaded New York State to renew his medical license if he promised to care for the poor. Berkman returned to what had brought him to politics in the first place. He knew his political actions, prison time, and cancer had to count for something. For the next decade, he became an expert on the care of those with HIV AIDS in New York's Black and Puerto Rican communities, then became involved in the global fight against AIDS through Columbia University's School of Public Health. Horrified by the way the international AIDS community was not making the new life-saving drugs available to the global poor in the late 1990s, early 2000s, Berkman was spurred to peaceful action. With other comrades, he organized um, an organization called Health Gap, the Health Global Access Project in 1999. Using direct action, uh, direct action and direct confrontation with political leaders, brilliant lobbying and demonstration, alliances with other groups in the global south, including the treatment action campaign in South Africa, and eventually work with the Clinton and then Bush administrations, the group was able to get U.S. policy changed to allow generic forms of the new drugs into other countries at reasonable costs. The actions probably saved millions of lives. And this is a picture of a demonstration Alan was part of and his group helped to organize in Durban during an HIV AIDS international conference in 2000. And this is Alan a few years later um, getting out of his uh, cancer sick bed to be at a demonstration at the United Nations. Berkman spent his last years of his life training another generation of global public health practitioners as he worked in Tanzania, Uganda, South Africa, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, and other countries. He lived to enjoy his life with his wife, comrade, Dr. Barbara Zeller, his daughters, and grandchild. It's the picture of Alan and Barbara together. Finally, his seventh round of cancer caught up with him, and he passed away in June of 2009. Not many of us, of course, will ever have Berkman's particular blend of personal conviction, willingness to take risks, loving and principled support, and ability to suspend fears in order to make commitments. Most of us will not turn to violence as a way to make social change, and many on the left saw the actions of Brinks and the bombings as demented, and more importantly, not politically useful. Berkman's commitment, however, to equality and solidarity never wavered as his tactics for making change um, did. Berkman's choices ask us to think about how our own commitments are or are not grounded in principled support to end structural racism and imperialism. Many of us understand but do not support the turn toward violent trashing of federal buildings or the setting of fires, especially when it's not clear if this is being done by frustrated anarchists or agents provocateur. But those of us in public health, and especially in this caucus, I think, understand the particular importance of the commitment within our field to fight for an end to all of the upstream structures, as we put it, that make gaining decent health and a reasonable life often so difficult. Berkman's stories ask those of us who are white in particular to think about what does it mean to be a co-conspirator if we are serious about the long effort to dismantle structural racism and to fight state violence. As we now confront the structures of power that Berkman and his comrades tried to overcome, we're asked anew whether we are willing to act and in what ways. It is a time, I think, for a new co-conspiracy that is attuned to the very specifics of our political now as we continue the work that Berkman and others like him did to try and change American society. Even if we think some of what he did was wrongheaded, his commitment to justice is a lesson we all need to consider. Thank you. Okay, and Joe. So I'm going to suggest that we use a stack system because uh, I have a feeling that this is um, an exuberant audience <laughs> moderating. So if you want to uh, ask Susan a question um, or make a statement, uh, just say, put uh, in the chat, put the word stack, and you'll be next. Okay, you're going to call on everybody, Ken. I'm not going to look at it. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, if, if nobody else has a question, I'll start with, with one, Susan. Um, how do you think, what is it that you think that people in the left today can learn from Alan's experience and from those times? 
I think what's so interesting about him was, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting is that he clearly didn't come from a lefty family. I mean, he learned this, right? So it wasn't like this was his birthright. I mean, action, I think, clearly was his birthright in lots of ways, but it wasn't that, you know, I think anti-racists have to be made. They're not just born that way. So I think part of that is to think about what his commitments were about and what it meant to make a lifetime commitment to this struggle and to also think about um, how he changed over time, what he struggled with as a pretty, I mean, when I started to talk to people at Columbia, for example, about him, everybody said, oh, he's such a sweet man, such a nice guy. And all I remembered from both high school and college was this incredibly brilliant guy who was unbelievably arrogant and really difficult. So I kept asking my high school girlfriends at one point, I said, what do you remember about him? So I think one of the things that's fascinating is you know, how he changed and how he took seriously the critique of people of color and of his feminist colleagues. And he really, um, as his colleague Laura Whitehorn said, he struggled with it all his life. But I think that that's one of the things that's interesting. I think he really made a lifetime commitment. And then he tried to figure out how to, um, how to operationalize that and what it meant at what moment in time. I mean, I said in the book at one point, he was pretty good at one point about being a revolutionary, but not so good at looking at leading a revolution. Um, and so I think we have to really think hard, um, really hard about who we're gonna be in alliance with, what we can and can't do, and how that changes over time. I think that's what the lessons are. Thank you. Uh, Laura, you need to um, unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Susan. Hi, Hi Laura. Um, I want to point out that some of the people on this call are now working together to make structural changes <laughs> to the white supremacy of the prison system in New York State. So, you know, continuation. You know, I love you. I love your book, Susan. Um, the one thing I want to say is that I think that two things about the critique around violence. One thing is that, and Alan and I talked about this too, right when he died. Um, and we both went back and forth because we had critiques of how we had applied the lesson of if you're a member of the oppressor nation of the white settler colonialist country, you have to support the right of self-determination and that that includes the right to armed self-defense and armed revolution, which we saw going around on around the, the world in the 60s and 70s. We critiqued how we took that out of time. But the issue to me, and I think on and off maybe to Alan, but I think it's important for us was not so much violence and whether violence is right or wrong. I think that that's a choice that we white and other privileged people get to make but how it gets organized and whether it's um, the will of masses of people or it's being uh, applied by other people in the name of the masses of people. And to me, that, that was Alan's critique of what we had done. It was, it was that we weren't um, enough aware and enmeshed in the leadership of various different parts of the movements for national liberation. But I feel as if there is, you know, my critique of the left, of the entire left in the United States and of what we've accepted is that we have allowed this fetishization of nonviolence as if to choose. And, you know, when you look at the resistance, the uprising of the last few years, and you see that black kids who were fighting back against one more police killing were sort of held up as examples of some terrible choice of violence, you see that there's a problem in how we look at it. And just the last thing I wanna say is that I feel like one thing that was really strong, and I know Shelley Miller and, and Liz um, Horowitz and Joel Schwartz and Bob Letter are on this call too, and, um, and along with Dick Clapp and other people who were involved in the 60s and 70s, we were moved by an international anti-imperialist strategy. And it wasn't about like, let's try to do this tactic or this tactic. It was more, how do we, how do we play our role in the two, three many Vietnams that Che um, talked about? So Susan, my question to you is sort of with that context of the two, three many Vietnams and the challenge by Kwame Ture and all of that, how do you situate like the work that Alan did over time as part of that continuum, whether he was, whether we were bombing 
the Capitol or the PBA or something, or whether we were working together on right. health or prison health. Right. I think Laura's raised a really um, critical point, and um, it's in the book, but not didn't I didn't highlight it enough. I think in the talk, I think you're right. Um, which is um, the context of what was going on in the rest of the world and our sense of responsibility. Um, can you see me? Can, is it coming through? Okay, because you're still highlighted as, okay. Um, anyway, as um, so I think that that's really important that, that we saw ourselves, all of us, as part of an international, you know, a, a global movement um, that we had to make um, choices on, on what we could do. And I think the second thing I wanted to say about what you said is, um, I think as we get better histories of the nonviolence movement, I think we really have to understand how much of, especially when you talk to Southern black people who live in like Alabama and Mississippi, you understand how much people had guns. So, you know, King was able to march, you know, peacefully, but people really had guns in their homes and really used them when necessary. So I think the history of, the role of nonviolence has been kind of, as you said, sort of somewhat fetishized um, and then again used um, to critique um, the anger. And I think it's sometimes hard. I remember teaching um, the killing of, of uh, oh God, um, uh, Medgar Evers, and he, you know, who gets shot in his driveway. And one of my students, this was like in the 80s, said to me, well, I don't understand what, you know, they were so angry about. And I said, well, like, what part don't you get? Your husband's coming home from work, gets out of his car, and he gets shot in the back, you know, um, in his driveway. You think you might get a little pissed off? <laughs> so, you know, just trying to get people to think about what that felt like. And I, you know, I, I mean, I think th these last few weeks watching the, you know, the Chauvin trial really makes you think about, you know, what else could have happened there? Had the people standing online, you know, or, you know, watching um, Floyd being murdered, what if one of them had had a gun? What if they had, you know, done something more violent? Would the police have shot them? You know, could they have saved him? I mean, it raises all of these interesting questions about, what's moral in that given situation. So I think you're raising um, that question. It seems to me that's what you, and you know this better than I do, obviously, what you all tried to figure out um, over time. And I think we're still struggling with what, what will make for political, I mean, in the end, what it's about is what moves large numbers of people so that we can create the change, right? How do we reach those people? Not just that we act morally ourselves individually, but how do we collectively make that happen? And that seems to me the work we're trying to do in New York State, you know, we're working, frankly, with the legislature, right, to try to change the rules around imprisonment really matters in people's lives. Since we can't all show up with guns and free everybody from prison, that is not going to happen. So given that that's not an option, what else can we do, right? So. Ken, do you want to take over and ask? I'm, I'm waiting for other people to, to have questions. Do any other of the people who knew Alan want to add anything? Oh, you guys are worse than my students, for God's sakes. <laughs> Bob? Susan? Hey, Susan. Hey, Nancy. Hi there. Hi. 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 Um, you can't see me, but I can see you. Okay. Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, you remember the prison health study that I did? That was, uh, I did remember the prison yes, health study. Yes, health pack. I sure do. Yeah, yeah. health pack. So um, my conclusion was that um, it was the, the culture of the prison that had determined um, how the doctors treated the prisoners. And right. what I'm wondering, and that it was necessary for the um, for health, for the, you know, the, for the health system to be totally outside the prison context. That's and I'm right. wondering what kind of, who treated Alan? What, what do you know, whether it was within the prison system yeah. or was contracted or? Right. So, so Nancy, what Nancy's reminding you of is that when we were at Health Pack, um, so at the Health Policy Advisory Center in the early 70s, um, we had a, Nancy ran our prison health 
contract. And what her critique is, is exactly what people who have been trying to reform prison medical care have been saying for uh, decades, literally decades now, which is that the doctors have to be out somewhat outside the system. And Alan was primarily treated um, by physicians who were inside and um, the prison system. So when he was in the Marion Federal Prison, for example, um, the doctor who was supposed to treat him literally um, had a had a um, had gone to medical school, but had not um, gotten a um, you know hadn't wasn't licensed at all. And Alan honestly was the only licensed physician in the prison. Wow. Um, and he, um, you, the details are in the book, Nancy, but he would not, I mean, and he's right. If he had not been a physician, he would have died. It, it's absolutely clear that had he not known what to do under certain circumstances or what to ask for or how to guide the physicians who had no idea how to examine him, he would have been dead. Um, so um, the problem is the extent to which prison healthcare is still very much caught up in um, the, the physicians getting socialized by the, um, you know, by the, by the prison uh, authorities, uh, the way in which they see many people who show up as basically just being recalcitrant, all of that kind of stuff um, is exactly um, the, the issues that he was raising. Um, and I, Nancy, if you write me at sreverby at wellesley.edu, I'll send you the piece I wrote about prison healthcare. Um, uh, based on some of the work that Alan did as well, along with um, Dick Clapp, who's also on the call. He and Alan did a whole piece on the, the poisonous water, for example, that was in, um, you know, that was in uh, the prison in Marion. So yes. uh, Bob Letterer, then Dick Clapp, then Anne Emanuel Byrne. You need to unmute yourself. Thanks, and um, Hi, hello Bob. again, Susan. It's great to see you, and um, what a fantastic book she wrote, um, and I, I hope all of you will have time to read it. Um, it's really a, an exhaustive reconstruction of Alan's life um, that is deeply respectful and, and loving of the many contributions he made, um, and um, I just wanted to, I don't have a question, I just wanted to share a little bit about the brilliance I experienced of Alan when we collaborated to co-found Health Gap, the Global Access Project, 1999, um, because that kind of was the best of Alan's strategic thinking and, um, and deep, deep commitment to freedom and, and survival for people of color first and foremost. And that was, uh, by that time, Alan and I had been comrades in the anti-imperialist movement before he went underground in the late 70s, early 80s. And, um, and we corresponded while he was in prison. And then uh, several years after he went out, after he got out, when he and Barbara, um, on the occasion of the International AIDS Conference in Geneva in 1998, um, they both came back really morally outraged at the gross divide between the global north and the global south as far as access to these, at that time, new, powerful anti HIV drugs. Um, and came up with the plan that you saw quickly on screen, uh, a strategy uh, to really turn that situation around and came to me and my partner, now husband, um, John Riley, and said, you know, you guys are in ACT UP. We had been in ACT UP for quite a few years at that point. Um, and you're the only people I know who have the connections to the group that has to really take this take the bull by the horns and, and go with it as an activist strategy to put really serious heat on the pharmaceutical companies and the Clinton administration that are enabling their, um, their patent monopolies to smother and, and uh, commit genocide in the global South. And to make a long story short, together with another ACT UP comrade named Eric Sawyer, we worked together, the four of us, to convene a very broad-based coalition of AIDS and LGBTQ groups. Um, and that is what became Health Gap um, early in 99. And the rest is history. And um, it was absolutely Alan's kind of um, inspiration and fierce passion that we of privilege in the global north 
are in a position to actually make a difference against our government and our drug companies, but we have to mobilize very strategically on multiple levels on, you know, as ACT UP had done, right, through street protests, through civil disobedience, through clever media work, through, um, uh, you know, writing up proposals and, uh, and through partnering with the AIDS activist groups in the global south who got little publicity, but actually played a critical role in turning around their local AIDS pandemics, um, particularly in South Africa. Right. Um, and all of that work kind of came together um, and Alan was the inspiration behind it. So I just want to pay tribute to him again. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Ken. Hi. Ken, and I, Ken and I go back to 1963, I think, when we first hi. met. Um, I have a I want to circle back to the question Nancy Jervis raised about healthcare from the outside. And in Alan's case, Barbara was, you know, I would say his strongest medical support. She intervened in a way to save his life at least once, maybe more than that. And so that was something. So I mean, I'm glad Bob just raised up Barbara as a comrade and, and Susan did too. She, she was a critical person in this whole story. And I think the book, actually, Susan, I commend you for sort of raising Barbara up in the book as well. But um, she's a very key part of this. Um, I want to say one other person who also Ken knows, um, uh, there, there was a point at the DC house or the DC, the DC hospital um, prison ward where Alan was in desperate shape and a, a former roommate of mine and classmate of Ken's named Tom Sachs went and visited Alan in prison. Susan refers to this visit by these folks from a medical center in Washington, uh, one of whom was Tom Sachs. And he, he was an oncologist. He said, you know, Alan was getting terrible care. They were able to intervene in such a way that Tom said it, it was another save, another chance to save this, uh, you know, brilliant man's life. So those two things, I, I just wanted to add to the conversation. Um, and also, I, if you have a chance, Susan, the story about biting the IV line as something that Alan is one of the few people that I have ever known who could have figured out how to do that. That's right. And I, I did claim that I had a question and that was, how's the book doing? You know, I'm not, I'm not, um, I, first of all, I want to thank Dick for, um, for that. I mean, it, it really, and Alan was very clear about that. If he hadn't been who he was, if he hadn't been a doctor, if he hadn't been married to Barbara, if all of these other people who knew him and cared about what happened to him, he, he would have died so many times. It's like watching, um, I don't know, Lazarus keep, keep reappearing, you know, he just, he would be on the brink. And the story in the book, for those who don't know it, is that literally at one point when he was completely paralyzed and he kept calling out, he was in septic shock and he knew he was going to die if somebody didn't come in and intervene. He leaned his neck over, which is nothing he can do, and it sort of crunched the IV line, which then set off the alarm, which it often does when the IV doesn't work. And that's when the nurse came in and he screamed at her or him, I can't now remember, and said, I've been yelling, why haven't you come in? And, he, and she or he said to, her, to Alan, you guys yell all the time, we just ignore you. So, you know, it just is these moments of had he, as Dick said, had he not known that. Um, I'm not sure how the book's doing. I mean, trying to bring a book out in the, um, in the middle of a pandemic, of course, is not the world's best moment um, to try to do this. So all of the talks, have, as you can imagine, have been on Zoom. So I think it will have a, a life. I just think it's gonna take more time as things open up more. I think we'll try to figure out other ways to get it around um, to other kinds of audiences. So I don't really know at this point, you know, I mean, it's always weird when you, pub I mean, this is not my first blog, but you know, when you publish a book and then you send it out and then you bloody have no idea, you know, where it is or how it lands or what happens, you know, especially if you can't go around the country and PR it. Well, we all like it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, that matters to me a lot, but it would be nice to also get it out to people who didn't, you know, who aren't, you know, our age group as Liz raised this question of how would it, how would it go with younger people? And I've, I've done some talking about it. I definitely discussed it with my students last term. Um, so I think, um, I think it's worth thinking about what it, the impact of his life might be for younger physicians trying to think through, um, I think somebody raised this question too about how to make their commitments and, and what, what, what 
what way it goes. And I think the other thing about Alan's life is that he was lucky enough to have it be, for all of us, not long enough, clearly, but long enough for it to have different stories as part of it. So it's not like you only do one thing. I mean, obviously, when he quit, you know, after his internship year, he made a decision to no longer be a, you know, a scientific researcher. He made that choice, but he certainly, um, um, to to um, have had a chance to talk about you know to to try other things through the the years. And Emmanuel, thanks so much, uh, Susan. For uh, hi, hi, it's great to see you. Unfortunately, uh, although I was uh, privy to some of the embryonic stages of the book, uh, it's uh, your my copy is stuck in Canada Customs because the university's been closed all year. So oh I'm still looking forward to it, but. Um, I have two questions uh, from from your presentation. One, you uh, uh, mentioned that he was uh, Alan was allowed to, after being released uh, from prison. He, uh, it, he was allowed to practice mm -hmm. as long as he only uh, practiced in, in among poor patients or low income communities. Was that his condition, or was this the condition of his, uh, you know, on on his release? And if so, was this considered, a, you know, kind of a, a punishment or keeping him away from elites so he wouldn't, you know, kidnap them? Or what, what was the rationale behind that? And then I'll come to my other. I have to try to go back and look at it again. I think part of it was, I mean, mostly, so he had to renew his license. That's what happened. He had never lost it, but he had to renew it. So they had a, uh, his lawyer, Ron Kuby, who was, a, was brilliant around this, had to convince the New York State Board that he wasn't going to be a danger. So most doctors lose their licenses if they, you know, murder someone, do something really egregious or are very heavy into drugs. So as Ron said in one of the interviews, it was hilarious. He said, somebody on the board said, gee, this Dr. Berkman, he's had a really interesting interesting life. <laughs> so I don't think they'd ever seen anything like him. So I think at the beginning, he had to be also supervised by um, somebody else who, you know, went over his charts and things like that. But I think one of the things they encouraged him to do was to work with the poor. But I don't remember now, to tell you the truth, the details of whether that was an absolute requirement or not. But obviously, for him, it was not an issue. So yeah, yeah. And then um, I wanted to ask about the term co-conspirator and whether he utilized that. And, you know, these days, many people use uh, in solidarity or solidaire, if you're in a language that actually has that as a, yeah. uh, as a possibility uh, or, you know, in allyship. And, you know, what, what did it really mean in the constellation of his life, particularly taking into account the transnational and international right. movements to, to not put himself at, at the yeah. front in a sense. Uh, um, I think those of you, those who were in his group will have to answer that question better than I can. I, it, it wasn't a term he used, of course, the name they gave themselves because they were being indicted on, a cons on conspiracy charges um, in Washington. So all of them had had other cases against them. And then what the government did is sort of like reuse the same evidence again and then go after them as a conspiracy. So that's why they, they had to come up with a name for their group in order to raise money and to get their defense going. And so they called themselves the resistance conspiracy case. Um, so that's where the term conspiracy was a way in which for, for them to, to use the terms the government was using, but to re was to reverse it in the way, you know, we use the term queer or slot, you know, ourselves or bitch as a way to say we're reclaiming um, that space. But it wasn't a term that they used. It's just when I found the quote from Alicia Garza, it felt like a really nice way to explain the difference between being an ally and being a co-conspirator and because of the case. So that's why I picked it. I mean, I originally the book was his, um, he never published it, but he has an unpublished um, autobiography, which frankly, thank God made a lot of this possible because he wrote it, but he also got his friends to mail his letters back to him because obviously he's writing them in his handwriting in prison. There are no carbon copies. There's no email, right? But he had, um, there must have been 500 to 1,000 letters that he had in, uh, that Barbara had kept in their apartment. And that's what I had access to. As you know, as a historian, you can't write this if you don't have primary materials. Um, and he called, his prison name was Brother Doc. So for a long time, I called the book Brother Doc. And then I 
decided it couldn't be the title for the book, A, because it really was his, and second of all, because that really was the term that, effect, that was about his experience in prison, and the book wasn't just about the prison experience. It didn't work. Um, somehow, that's how I came up with co-conspirator, and then it was co-conspirator for what? You know, you, you know, when you write a book, it always takes a while um, till you figure out what the title is going to be and how it's going to work and how many metaphors you can shove into it. Right. <laughs> It will make sense to somebody other than you, right? So that's how it came up. But it wasn't a term particularly that was used in that time period that I know of. I mean, other people can answer that, but I don't think so. Thank you. Sure. Jim Russell, you still want to talk? Your question? Sure. Um, this is a related question from that period of time. Do you have any information about David Gilbert and the campaign around him? Um, I don't have specific information about David, the campaign for David. I did go see him actually in prison and talk to him. It was the, his is actually was the first prison visit I ever did was to go see him, which was um, a totally stunning experience for me. And in fact, um, every time I did a prison visit, I got sick afterward. I mean, it was just amazing. I just think, you know, I think everybody should have to do a prison visit because I think you really get a sense of what it means um when and see how people are treated um but i believe there's a quiet campaign going on to support david and i can get you if you email me i'll get you the i'll get you to the right people who are involved in it. but yes there's a campaign going on to try to get david out martha hi i just want to thanks so much susan wonderful presentation um i just wanted to make one quick point um, some of us were in parallel organizations that didn't do the kinds of things that put us in the kind of harm's way that Alan, uh, that Alan was put in. Um, I got to meet him a couple of times over the years. I believe he gave a presentation for us at SCAPA, uh, Socialist Caucus of APHA. Uh, and I know that we had him at one of our PNHP New York Metro forums just a couple years before uh, he left us. Um, and I was blown away, not just by his humanity, not just by his humility. So interesting to hear how you describe him as a brash high school guy. Yeah. Uh, he just, that was gone. He was, there was a deep humility and compassion about his mode of presentation, but the reason that I wanted to just say one quick word was to say that he was organizationally brilliant. Yes. His presentation just blew me out of the water. As somebody who's been involved in organizing my whole life, I was like, this guy really gets it, really knows how you build on you know, you figure out what's your first demand and then you win that demand because then you can move on to yes. and, and build a movement and build strength. And he was really amazing in that. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it is that he was, you know, I mean, we don't, we use the term brilliant a lot in our culture, but he really was brilliant. I mean, I always kid that um, he bloody won the history award when we graduated from high school. I was so pissed off about that. I can't begin to tell you. Um, and the only thing I can tell you is we were lab partners in biology and he was actually quite squeamish <laughs> about dissecting the frog. I had no problem dissecting the frog. So go figure, right? Um, but I think that the, that, brilliance that could have led to a very, very different kind of career. I mean, most of us think he had a kind of um, photographic memory. And so he just, you know, he did that. And he just didn't seem to work terribly hard um, at the academic stuff. It just, he would listen to a lecture and it would just stay in his head and he could, you know, and then, but he began to realize that. I mean, at one point he said, you know, I became the perfect test taking machine. Um, and he knew what he knew and didn't know. And I think the work that he did when he was at Columbia and then in the, in the, in the um, health groups that he was part of in the units that he worked in, uh, you know, in the health, health centers, he began to appreciate what he couldn't do. And I think it's Dick Clapp who said this to me, or someone said to me, you know, I think Alan at some point figured out that no matter how brilliant a physician he was and how much he could figure out how much to titrate this drug or that, 
that the fact that he had it, and he, he tells the story numerous times, sometimes it's a man and sometimes it's a woman, but it's about sending someone home in congestive heart failure who has to walk up five flights of stairs to get to their apartment. And he realizes that no matter what he does and how he treats this patient, no matter how humane and decent he is, he can't save her. He, he can't save her unless he, as we say, focuses upstream. And I think that was a profoundly important experience for him. And then I think a lot of what, I mean, I know this from my health pack days when we would give lectures on this and people would just say, but it's just too big. I can't figure out how to take on, how do I take on global capitalism and imperialism? And I think what you are saying captures him. He had a sense of how to, how to operationalize that, that understood that in the end, what we were trying to do was overcome all of this, but how we got there, he had a really amazing um, strategic sense that just developed from listening. I mean, he really did hone in on his listening skills from the people around him. And he could, I mean, you know, he could also, I, I mean, I interviewed enough people who knew him at Columbia. You know, he had his own moments of arrogance. I mean, he was a brilliant guy and I think, you know, a lot of it, and I talked a lot about, I mean, I wrote a very, very long chapter about our, the little town we grew up in, but, you know, part of it was, it was the fifties. There were very few Jews. There were 20 of us in my high school graduating class of maybe two or 300. Um, and we were, we were outsiders in lots of ways. We always were going to be the outsiders because we were going to leave, you know, most of us left um, and didn't stay. And, there was a kind of pressure for conformity. It was the 50s. It was very much the Cold War. My high school had an overnight shelter drill in which people stayed in the sub basement. And the joke I always tell everybody is at least among the girls was during the middle of the Cuba Missile Crisis when we actually thought we were all going to get bombed to death. Um, we went around trying to figure out which guy we were going to lose. We were all straight at that point. Um, who we were going to lose our virginity to in case you know we were about to die because who wanted to die without having sex first? You know. So he comes out of that, um, you know, that milieu. Um, and then he really gets transformed by, I mean, he really becomes a co-conspirator and an ally because he really listened, particularly to the women, both in his political struggle, but also to the women who were his patients and who became his comrades. And I think that's a lesson that most of us aren't very good at. Jean Schiff. Thanks. I don't know how much time we have left, but um, thank you for um, reaching out to me, uh, Susan, um, during the stages of the book. Um, I had a chance to meet Alan um, maybe in the last four or five years of his life when um, he was doing some of the international AIDS activist work. Um, I guess I didn't, Health Gap, um, I, I learned just today during this meeting about that those origins, maybe four or five years before I met him um, with ACT UP and Health Gap. And then by the time we crossed paths, he was working with Columbia University and sort of more of an official capacity. And we were challenging the, the university and, and the Clinton uh, Foundation and these other groups to sort of do more and work more quickly to um, increase access to antiretroviral medications at the time. So um, it was an incredible meeting him and, and just now and reading the book and, and hearing all these, um, looking at the slides and seeing the pictures to see about his earlier life sort of before I met him after he had gone through so many different phases um, that you sort of capture is, is just incredible. Um, I think my parents are usually the ones on this these meetings, March and Gordy, so they send their regards to those of you who they know. Um, and I guess just looking at um, some of the follow-up questions and um, thinking about the COVID um, vaccine rollout and what Alan would have um, said about this and sort of the inequities that we're seeing very um, similarly to what happened um, in HIV, but just playing out a little bit more quickly right now, I'm sure he would have been fighting for, for um, equal right. access to all and, and trying to right. get rid of the patents or, you know, get right. more people access to life-saving. Yeah, and life Health Gap is doing more work on it um, as well. And in fact, I've got a research student um, from who, when I taught last semester doing some research on this because I want to write a piece that's about what was tried during Health Gap and what's going on now and what, what the change has been like. So I'm interested in trying to think about um, how we deal with the patents now and how we deal with what kind of pressure can be put on the Biden administration to get, you know, the drugs out um, more readily. So I think it's an interesting question and I, I miss him. I wish he were here to help us think about it. Cassidy Lee. Uh, hi, thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, I think you already sort of answered my questions. Um, yeah, I was just, I'm a young student just um, thinking about um, what, 
we can learn from uh, Alan's life and especially in, in, in the light of um, like the failures of electoralism um, and um, the impending and ongoing climate catastrophe. Um, what sort of things do you think that he would try to communicate with us? And for those of that, you that knew him, um, what, what would you say to, to somebody coming up? Right. I, I think he would, I mean, I think given his trajectory, he probably would have been very involved with, um, assuming he was still, you know, well enough to do this, very involved in trying to use the model of what Health Gap was able to do and the connections that they have with the global south. I think Bob raised that really importantly. I mean, the way in which, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about their ability to do it was they start doing this just as the internet becomes, you know, more widely available so that they're able to communicate um, with people in the global south very differently than those of us who, you know, organizing the 60s, 70s depended on leafleting and telephone trees and, you know, face-to-face -face meetings. And now you could do a lot of it on, the, on email and in the internet. Um, so I think he would be very deeply involved in whatever kinds of actions are going to happen as we move forward to try to think about um, how to force um, these drug companies and the United States government to make supplies be more widely available. And I think there's a bit more consciousness now that um, I wrote a piece about this in, in the turn of the 20th century, um, an editor in a, at the uh, Atlanta Constitution said, um, germs know no color line. Um, so I think the same thing could be said about viruses, no, no national boundaries or state boundaries either. And so I think the awareness that, frankly, if Americans ever want to go on safari again, I mean, to be completely blunt about this, or go to Italy, we're going to have to figure out how to share um, this. And we're going to have to work on those kinds of issues. And I, I'm hopeful, I'm about to actually write something about this right now, I am hopeful that the post-COVID, and there will be a point in which we're post-COVID, presumably, lessons about what we need to do about rebuilding public health in the United States will hopefully, there'll be more of a constituency to think about that more um, directly. So that's one of the things I think people can become involved in. And I also think people have to do what they love. And if you really want to be a really super good bedside physician, then you should do that. You know, I just think there are different, I mean, we need all of us to do what feels right at the moment in time. And hopefully you'll have enough time in your life to do some of that and then to change and do other things. I mean, you know, that happened to him um, for a variety of reasons, but I also think it might be possible for younger people too. I mean, we all, I once gave a talk at Wellesley called How I Got Here From There. I mean, I have an undergraduate degree in industrial and labor relations, and I thought I was gonna be a personnel administrator. So go figure, right? Right, didn't happen. So Marnie, you asked a question about um, Mailman School, uh, Columbia School of Public Health students um, hearing about Allen. Um, Susan, you did a presentation at Grand Rounds for epidemiology at, at Mailman. Yeah, I did a talk. I mean, the problem is, you know, the, the, the groups change every two years. So, it, you know, at least for people coming in for an MPH. So I did um, the Berkman lecture a number of years ago when I was first working on the book. Um, and then I did a grand rounds for the epi department last fall. Um, but for those of you who are at Mailman, you know, obviously Zoom, I mean, I'm now vaccinated. Hopefully at one of these times I can actually go back to New York. Um, but I would be glad to come. I would be glad to give another talk about Alan um, at the Mailman School, whatever you want. So just, you know, okay. get in touch with me. It's easy enough. Yeah. No, I, I'm actually not an epi. I'm in sociomedical sciences. And, uh -huh. um, um, and I, it, it was very interesting timing. Um, I had just been advising a student, a former student of mine, working on a paper who got this four crushing reviews, but yet supportive, sort of, of an article we did together. It was his first article. Um, and he was devastated. And I said, well, you know, I had this amazing mentor, Alan Berkman, who, you know, my first study, he told me, the voices of who you have captured voices you must publish no matter how how much your ego is dented you know and and it was like literally the next day kim hopper who was trying to get on tonight and couldn't join sent oh. me this link um you know that was back when i was a doctoral student now i've been faculty for you know 12 years but i just thought alan would be such an inspiration to i mean my our students in sms don't know his story and he, right. he stayed with me so i was just thinking um, particularly now it's so easy with Zoom. It would be wonderful to um, 
Yeah. I'd, I'd be glad to, Marnie, whatever you want. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm now emerita, so I don't have the teaching responsibilities and I, you know, I still have most of my uh, faculties. So um, <laughs> I'd be glad to, you know, um, I, you know, and I have a yeah. warm um, spot. I've sent a number of my students to your department and, um, yeah. the years, you know, and I'm very good friends with a number of the people in your department. Oh, great. Um, so um, I'd be glad to do whatever you want. So okay. just, you know, get in touch with me. It's easy. Okay. You, Okay, I still have my yeah. email at Wellesley, so it's easy and can okay. get you. Okay. One thing you might be able to do is talk to the epi department and see whether they archived Susan's Grand Rounds. Yeah. Might be available. Well, I was actually thinking when she had said the book is out and you're going to be doing talks or yeah. it was more just it's such a nice moment with the new book to help people understand his role. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. But thank you for that. Sure. No problem. Be glad to do it. And um, Martha raised that. I, Martha, I'd love to talk to uh, West Ridge. It's one of my favorite places on the planet. So I'd be glad to um, come. Uh, the uh, last talk I actually gave at Old Westbury was on Jewish prostitution. So that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I actually have a suggestion about mailmen. Uh -huh. um, Hi, Liz. Hi. I, I won't go into how much I love your book, Susan, and how moving it was. I am an old friend of Alan's. Um, but I also was lucky enough to be a student at Mailman when Alan was teaching. Um, so just a funny little anecdote. I, um, I was studying for an exam and as part of answering the questions that I had to answer, I listened to Alan's lecture on South Africa over and over again, along with others. And my son who was doing his high school homework in the other room, I guess heard the content, but didn't really hear that it was Alan's voice and came in at some point and said, who is that guy? That is like a brilliant talk about South Africa. I've never heard anybody explain racism so well. And, <laughs> and, and it was funny because he of course talked to Alan every week and saw him every weekend. And he listened to the entire lecture and then played it um, for a lot of his friends. He went to uh, Beacon High School and they were doing a lot of anti-racism work. So, they played a recording of it so they could try and understand the role of white supremacy in South Africa. So I would suggest in addition to trying to see if Susan's lecture is archived, Barbara and I have actually been trying to find a copy of that lecture Alan gave okay. for this epi class on South Africa that I, I was so proud to know him sitting in that audience. It was really the most brilliant lecture and everybody was talking about it after. It was like an epi lecture of like 200 mailman students. Right. And, I, and I know that it was, um, I know that it was taped because I listened to it over and over again, but I can't find it in my computer. So maybe somebody at mailman could find that. Right, and I have, Barbara gave me his thumb drives so I have his PowerPoints. I can look and see what I've, I mean, that won't give you the lecture, but I might have the PowerPoints. Oh, okay. So I'll look, I'll look for it. It was, it was so brilliant. Even I, who knew him, his yeah. good points and his bad points and had heard everything he had to say, was very <laughs> impressed by it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any last questions? Well, thank you all for coming. Susan, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for asking. I really appreciate both talking to the home team, frankly, and to really trying to think about, you know, what, a, like all historians, you know, I mean, we don't practice preventive history, but we do really try to help you think about what was possible. I mean, we have to imagine what was possible in the past. And Alan's a really good example of what you could couldn't have, I could never have imagined that this would happen to my, you know, childhood friend whose bar mitzvah I went to, you know, this could never have been his story. You know? So there's that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Everybody um, know that two months from now, the next session will be about Lincoln Hospital and the Lincoln Collective and the community organization surrounding that. Um, and probably Ali Fine, Charlotte Phillips, and Cleo oh, wow. will be among the panelists. Um, you might want to stop by. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. You. Bye -bye. Stay well. Get vaccinated. Bye.